ahead and uh, get started so we can uh, finish on time. I, uh, my name is Khalid Jahshan. I'm the uh, executive director of uh, the center here, Arab Center Washington, and I would like to welcome you uh, to this uh, special session, briefing, if you will, on the future of Gaza between domestic and regional uh, politics. A friend of mine, some of you might uh, remember the name, who passed away uh, a few years back, uh, Faiz Abu Rahmi, who was a very prominent lawyer uh, in Gaza and for a while was the public prosecutor, actually, in Gaza for quite a few years. And he was also uh, the president of the Bar Association uh, for many years. He used to come to the States quite often in the interpol days we used to invite him to come here to brief people about the human rights situation uh, in Gaza and used to particularly speak to uh, people at the, uh, in Congress and at the National Security Council and so on. He always used to start his remarks about Gaza by saying, welcome to the planet of Gaza. Mm -hmm. So today, on behalf of uh, the late Faiz Abu Rahmi, welcome to the planet of uh, Gaza. I say that because, frankly, you know, I, people joke always about every country uh, does have or deserves its south. But uh, Gaza has been neglected uh, for a long, long time for very diverse reasons, uh, some domestic uh, to the Palestinians uh, and some beyond uh, the uh, help of the uh, Palestinians. But after years of neglect, it seems to me that the Gaza Strip appears all of a sudden to be getting its somewhat fair share uh, of attention uh, over the past uh, few weeks. Uh, today, the streets of Gaza are abuzz with rumors about renewed diplomatic efforts uh, to ease the uh, Israeli siege and to pursue the long elusive national reconciliation uh, between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah, uh, controlled by the rival uh, Fatah uh, movement. Uh, this past weekend, uh, to be precise, uh, on the 9th of September, uh, Ismail Hani, the head of Hamas's uh, policy, Bureau uh, left Gaza for the first time since his election uh, this past May, and accompanied by uh, Hamas's uh, Gaza chief, Yahya Sinwar, who seems to be like the new Hamas star, if you will, uh, in, in Gaza at, uh, at this period, and his deputy, uh, Khalil uh, Al Hayya, to hold meetings with uh, senior uh, Egyptian political and intelligence officials in Cairo. The agenda, uh, as far as what you know, was announced uh, in the media, included bilateral relations, of course, with Egypt, including uh, basically the movement of uh, people between Gaza and, and, and Egypt, the situation with Sinai, uh, the tunnels, the trade with Gaza, and, and so on. But in addition, also two objectives were added to the agenda, which is easing the blockade, particularly from the Egyptian side, and Palestinian reconciliation. Uh, today, as we speak, uh, an official Palestinian delegation in response to pressure uh, from Egypt and, and others, uh, uh, the government in Ramallah uh, sent a large delegation today. Uh, it's on its way to Cairo right now and will be meeting uh, over the next uh, 48 hours uh, with the, their counterparts uh, from the Egyptian government and also uh, from uh, Hamas. The Hamas delegation was joined earlier this week by a high-level delegation of Hamas leaders from outside, not just the people from uh, Gaza, including such names that are familiar to many of you, and I see a lot of faces who are quite familiar with the Palestinian uh, political names. Uh, Musa Abu Marzouk is there, uh, Saleh al aruri is there, and others. So it's quite interesting uh, that this week's meeting uh, by Hamas leadership uh, took place in Cairo rather than what was anticipated a few weeks ago, maybe in Doha. Uh, statements uh, issued uh, by Hamas before and after leaving Gaza expressed the readiness of the Islamic movement uh, to reconcile uh, with, Fatah, with Fatah with no preconditions, which was surprising. Because frankly, the last few months, all the statements, all the exchanges, whether statements by Fatah in Ramallah or statements by Hamas in Gaza or by Hamas in the diaspora have all listed all kinds of preconditions for possible uh, meetings to pursue uh, reconciliation. Indeed, in a statement issued on Monday, 
in Cairo, Hamas said it was prepared to dissolve the administrative committee, which is a committee it established in uh, Gaza uh, after it took over uh, the uh, strip, uh, as requested recently uh, by the PA in Ramallah, that this administrative uh, committee is in direct violation of earlier arrangements between uh, Fatah uh, and Hamas, and it needed to be uh, closed down. So Hamas uh, previously uh, demanded uh, that the PA also uh, cancel on its part several punitive measures it implemented against Gaza, including uh, most recently the slashing of civil servants' uh, salaries, including, by the way, uh, former Fatah members uh, in Gaza who are still on the payroll, and disrupting the electric power uh, to the Strip by refusing to pay the bill uh, to the Israelis and to others to maintain, if you will, the generators uh, going in, in, in Gaza. Now, undoubtedly, uh, the Hamas gathering in Cairo is significant to both the Egyptian government and to the Palestinian side. However, its significance is not limited to bilateral relations or to internal Palestinian implications. The unusual event cannot be divorced today from the regional turbulence affecting Arab politics way far away from Gaza uh, and Ramallah, particularly as we shall hear in a bit when you take into consideration some of the regional powers uh, that are in play or actually participants uh, in these ma political maneuvering, uh, maneuverings that are taking place. Now central to this development is what is locally dubbed in Gaza as the Dahlan plan or the ultimate plan for Gaza, some media outlet uh, locally in the region call, uh, calls it. The reference here is to uh, Mohammed Dahlan. Uh, for most of you, uh, you're probably familiar with him, but for those who are not, I'll just say a couple words about him. Uh, Mohammed Dahlan is a 55-year-old uh, native, actually, of the Gaza Strip. He was born and raised uh, in Khan Yunus, uh, became a young uh, Fatah activist, and that's where ba basically uh, he met uh, his hometown uh, friend at the time, Sinwar, who currently now is the head of the Gaza uh, Hamas uh, branch. They also met again later uh, as they graduated uh, from Israeli jail and they got to know each other better, I, I guess, in, in, uh, during their, their tenure in Israeli jail. Um, <coughs> As an exiled, uh, uh, he's an exiled former uh, Fatah security chief, uh, of course, blamed for the events of 2006, 2007, the failure of Fatah to maintain control of uh, uh, Gaza and basically uh, Hamas uh, takeover of the Gaza Strip and the division of Palestine that resulted uh, from that confrontation. He was once considered persona non grata by both uh, Palestinian factions, Hamas and uh, Fatah, but now he seems to be engaged in this new uh, negotiations uh, to try to strike a deal uh, with uh, the Hamas, Hamas section uh, or division that is receptive uh, to his ideas. Dahlan uh, is a businessman these days. Uh, he lives in the United Arab Emirates and in Egypt. And he has become, uh, most media outlets describe him as a multimillionaire uh, who is politically affiliated uh, with the UAE and uh, with Egypt uh, at this time. The plan itself, known as the Dahlan plan, as I said, is essentially a power sharing uh, plan for Gaza, aiming, number one, at lifting uh, the siege of Gaza, particularly uh, its border uh, with uh, Egypt. Uh, the Rafah uh, uh, exit, and also to revive uh, the battered uh, uh, Gaza economy. Most of us are fami familiar with the statistics and numbers about the miserable economic uh, situation uh, in, uh, in Gaza uh, through bringing, uh, by promising to bring, uh, the much needed uh, foreign investment uh, into the Gaza Strip and particularly fuel uh, to end uh, the crippling uh, power outages, including the plan uh, talks about the possibility of even a small refinery or a generator, generating station built this time inside Egyptian territory uh, to generate, uh, to facilitate, if you will, 
the import of fuel, uh, maybe from the Gulf, uh, to generate energy uh, for uh, Gaza and maintain uh, the electricity uh, flowing. Now, the controversial plan raises many questions about both its political objectives and its implications. Uh, for the sake of the discussion today, I would like to mention five or six uh, questions and, and hope that uh, our esteemed uh, uh, guest speakers today will, will focus on those in their uh, remarks. One, are Fatah and Hamas seriously trying to reconcile now? Is this a serious attempt? After all, we've seen this film before, okay? So for those of us who have been watching uh, Palestinian politics for a while, uh, we've seen this film at least 10, 15 times uh, over the past uh, few years. Two, when Hamas talks about Fatah, which Fatah is it talking about? When it says, I am or we are willing to start negotiating without preconditions with Fatah, are they talking about Ramallah's Fatah? Are they talking about uh, Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen's Fatah? Or are they talking about Dahlan's uh, Fatah? So it, there is a bit of confusion as to uh, what is meant uh, by uh, a simple name. Three, is the plan attributed to Dahlan indeed the answer to Gaza's economic and political woes? Is this what Gaza needs right now? Four, what is Dahlan's personal political agenda? It's hard to kind of, he has been uh, somewhat elusive and uh, doesn't meet the media all the time, the press, but he has said enough, uh, particularly as of late, and it would be interesting to kind of discuss a little bit his personal uh, political agenda. Five, why is the plan viewed with suspicion in Ramallah? Is it indeed a conspiracy, quote unquote, or, or a, a plan to undermine Abu Mazen and kind of take over the West Bank? Uh, can Dahlan, through his partnership with Hamas, actually, in practical terms, take over uh, the West Bank? Does he have the grassroots support or base uh, in the West Bank to do so. What are the real intentions of regional powers and their role in the affairs of Gaza? Is Egypt indeed behind what it claims to be doing right now, or is there an Egyptian agenda that's totally different from the declared objective of this mediation uh, between these different parties? Same thing applies to the Emirates, same thing applies to the Qataris, same thing applies to many other players uh, in this uh, crisis. And last, what are the regional implications of a Gaza deal uh, beyond Palestine, uh, number one, uh, particularly uh, its impact now on renewed attempts, whether by the US or others, to revive uh, Palestinian-Israeli talks. Should these talks succeed, or should this reconciliation succeed, how, what, would, what would be the impact on uh, such uh, attempts? Now, uh, to answer these and other questions, we are delighted to have as our speakers two extremely qualified and well-informed uh, analysts on Palestinian-Israeli affairs. Uh, both are well known to uh, any foreign policy Middle East-oriented uh, group, but again, for the sake of those who never met them before, let me just say a couple of words about each. Our first speaker would be Ambassador uh, Jacob or Jake. Uh, Wallace, a good friend for many years, uh, through his uh, 30 some years, 35 years uh, of service in uh, foreign service uh, of this country. And uh, he has served, uh, uh, right now, he is a non-resident senior fellow in Middle East program at Carnegie, and uh, where he focuses on Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, affairs. Some of you might uh, have seen uh, his article in Diwan, which is the Carnegie newsletter Middle East Center, uh, Return of the Native, which actually gave me the idea for this panel because that's what it is. Uh, it, it's uh, basically an article uh, that he co-wrote with, uh, authored with Michelle Dunn uh, regarding Dahlan. Is the prodigal son coming back uh, to take over Gaza and what are uh, the implications? Uh, Jake served as ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Tunisia uh, back in uh, 2012 to 2015. Uh, and for many years before that, uh, uh, he also served as Consul General, U.S. Consul General in Jerusalem between 2005 and 2009, which is a very interesting assignment in the Foreign Service. For those of you who do not know, uh, it's one of those consulates that reports directly uh, to uh, the highest uh, position 
uh, in, in the, state, the State Department and the government of the United States. It's viewed independent, if you will, from our embassy uh, in, in uh, Tel Aviv. And it's kind of our, virtually what it is, is our embassy to the Palestinians. Uh, in, in practical terms, it's not called an embassy in the absence of diplomatic recognition and relations, but that's what it is. Our second speaker is Yusuf Munayer, who is the executive director of the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights uh, in the United States, and he's also a colleague, uh, a non-resident analyst here at the uh, Arab Center, uh, Washington, D.C., where he also focuses on uh, Palestinian-Israeli uh, uh, affairs. And uh, Yusuf is a frequent uh, uh, guest on many, many TV uh, networks, uh, both uh, Arabic and English uh, language. He has written a long list of articles and publications like the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Nation, Foreign Policy, uh, uh, etc. And he holds a PhD degree from the University of Maryland in International Relations and uh, Comparative uh, Policy. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, both uh, speakers. We will begin uh, with Ambassador Jake uh, Wallace in a couple of minutes, but let me just uh, set uh, the rules for the Q&A session to follow both speakers. There are cards and pencils uh, on your seats or in front of you at the table. Uh, if you have a question or a comment, uh, comment about either speaker, please just indicate your name, ask your question, preferably question, uh, if you're interested in speaking to this group, uh, let me know later. We will invite you for a future event. <laughs> so no long, <laughs> no long lectures, uh, just uh, short comments uh, are welcome, uh, but mostly uh, questions addressed to specific uh, speaker. And we'd be delighted uh, once you have the question, raise your hand, staff would collect the card, bring him over here, and uh, we would be glad to read your question and ask our guest speakers to respond uh, to that. Uh, again, as I said, uh, we are uh, broadcasting uh, live on our website for those who were not able to be with us today. So if you could limit your movement in the room to avoid blocking uh, the cameras, and uh, we would uh, appreciate that. Uh, Jake, please. Uh, thank you, thank you, Khalil. Uh, thanks for the, uh, the invitation to come speak here at the Arab Do you Center. mind using the oh, podium? Yeah, come over there, sure. As I, as I was saying, oh, let me, I wrote down the questions. I want to make sure I answer your questions. Uh, anyway, thanks, thanks again for the invitation. Uh, it's uh, great to be here at the Arab Center. Um, uh, I thought I'd start with actually a personal comment. Uh, uh, as you said, Khalil, in your introduction, I've, I've been with the State Department 35 years before I retired uh, just a few months ago. Uh, most of that time I spent working on the Middle East and in particular on the, the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. Uh, but the first job I had working on the Middle East in the State Department was actually working on Gaza. Uh, I was, in, in 1988, uh, an economic officer in the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv. In those days, the Embassy in Tel Aviv handled our relations with Gaza, uh, where the consulate dealt with the West Bank. Uh, so I was, um, I was in charge of our assistance programs in Gaza, um, economic issues regarding Gaza. Uh, this was during the first intifada. And uh, I recall uh, almost 30 years ago spending a lot of time talking about the future of Gaza. Uh, and it's kind of uh, coming for full circle to be here 30 years later in Washington, again, talking about the future of Gaza. I thought in 1988 that Gaza's future would have been resolved by now, but unfortunately it's not, and Gaza uh, still faces some very significant challenges. Uh, and let me start with that, and just, just to sort of set the context, a few sort of basic facts about, about Gaza. Uh, Gaza is a, a very small area with a very high population density, a very high birth rate, uh, a low level of development, a lack of natural resources, including basic things like water, uh, and a tightly controlled borders on all sides, uh, and this ongoing division between Fatah and Hamas and between Gaza and the West Bank that, that Khalil mentioned. Uh, so in that, in that context, um, the long-term prospects for Gaza, I'd say, are not really very promising. Uh, these are very significant challenges that a place like Gaza faces. Uh, in the short term, however, uh, I think it's quite possible to improve the lives of, of Palestinians in Gaza. 
And potentially it's very easy to do so in some ways because the, the conditions right now are so bad in some areas that, that small things can make a very big difference. Um, so I, I think, in fact, that focusing on uh, the short term makes a lot of sense. And that's why I think the recent developments in particular, uh, these reports about cooperation between Hamas and Mohammed Dahlan are very interesting uh, because they have the potential to improve in the short term the situation in Gaza. And they also have the potential to alter Palestinian politics in a significant way. Uh, but at the same time, uh, these talks could also fall apart very easily given the animosity between Tahlan and Hamas and also the issues between Abu Mazen and both sides as well. Uh, so at this point, we have a lot of questions about, about what all this means for the future of Gaza. Um, and I'll do my best to try to answer some of those questions, but I think a lot of this is what we will know more about as the situation evolves. Um, Khalil talked about this, the reports of this, this deal between Hamas and Mohammed Dahlan to cooperate in running Gaza. Uh, the reports that we've seen in the press describe it in different ways. Some talk about a joint government with Dahlan as a prime minister. Uh, other reports have talked about sort of more case-by-case -case cooperation where Dahlan helps Hamas solve a particular problem like the crossing points with Egypt and finding a way to reopen them. Uh, at, this, at this point, it's not clear how this agreement would work, although my sense is that it's more likely to be um, in the form of sort of case-by-case -case cooperation rather than um, a new government or an official position for Dahlan, but time will tell on all of that. Um, the discussions um, are ongoing in Cairo, as Khalil mentioned. Um, <coughs> these reports are interesting also because of the very bad history between Dahlan and Hamas. When the PA ran Gaza between 1994 and 2007, Dahlan was in charge of Gaza security. And in that period when, when Arafat and then later uh, uh, Muhammad Abba, Mahmoud Abbas, when they wanted to crack down on Hamas, it was Dahlan who was the one who did it. And he often did it in a very brutal way. And there's a lot, a lot of old animosity and, and bad blood between the two sides. And in 2007, when Hamas fought the PA to take, over, to take control of Gaza, it was Dahlan who led the, the PA forces, and Dahlan was then on the losing side. Um, so how, how this will play out now will, is, again, remains to be seen. While there's a, lot, there's a basis for cooperation between Dahlan and Hamas, there's also a lot of bad blood and a lot of people who have, have some serious grudges against each other from those times. Um, as I said earlier, um, if this deal does work out, which remains to be seen, it has the potential to bring some alleviation to conditions in Gaza in the short term. Uh, what Dahlan brings to this um, puzzle is the strong support from the United Arab Emirates and from Egypt, uh, which amount to financial support from the UAE and access to and from Gaza through the Rafah crossing, which which Egypt can turn on and turn off as they wish. Uh, indeed, the, the, some of the reports about this deal uh, talk about assistance from the, the Emirates of $15 million a month uh, for Gaza. It's not clear what that money would be used for, but it's, uh, those are resources that basically are at Dahlan's disposal. And also a promise from Egypt to permanently reopen the Rafah crossing, which has not come about yet but that's been discussed as well. Uh, from Hamas's point of view, I think its willingness to work with, with an old enemy like Dahlan uh, reflects its weakness. Uh, Hamas has been under a lot of pressure recently from, from Ramallah, from the PA, from Israel, and from Egypt. And Hamas needed, I think, help to deal with the deteriorating conditions inside Gaza. Uh, Hamas has new leadership since the summer. Um, in Gaza, the new leader is Yahya Sinwar, who, as Khalil said, um, grew up in Han Yunus, um, and apparently he and Dahlan knew each other from those days. I don't know if they were friends, but they certainly knew each other in the refugee camp there. Uh, Sinwar, uh, who, who comes from the military wing of Hamas, um, seems to be much more interested in, in trying to deal with 
improving conditions for the people in Gaza, uh, and less so at the moment to get into a fight with Israel, uh, which, is, which is interesting. I think that was the opening uh, that led him to begin working with Dahlan um, about a potential deal. Uh, it's worth noting that there are different views on this within Hamas. The external leadership in particular seems less interested in what's going on in Gaza and they also seem less willing to be working with Dahlan. So this is very much an initiative by Sinwar uh, to deal with Dahlan. And it's not, uh, he's not supported on this point 100% within, within Hamas. Uh, the deal has significant implications for relations between the PA and Gaza and between Hamas and Fatah. Uh, President Abbas is very hostile to both ha Hamas and to Dahlan. And he has worked very hard to try to thwart this deal. And part of the, part of the, the new impetus for reconciliation between, between Fatah and Hamas, between Abu Mazen and Hamas, um, I think is a reaction to the potential deal between Hamas, between Hamas and Dahlan. There's a competition in a way for who will recon reconcile with Hamas. Is it Fatah, the large Fatah that, that Abu Mazen heads, or is it the, the Gaza faction that, um, that Dahlan represents. Um, this remains to be seen. So far, um, it seems that Abu Mazen has had little success in thwarting the deal between Dahlan and Hamas, uh, in part, I think, because his relations with Egypt and with the Emirates are quite bad right now, and they, they Egypt and the Emirates, have continued to support Dahlan. Um, but how this plays out also will be interesting. Um, while there's, I think, an interest in, in larger, the larger reconciliation between Hamas and Fatah, um, the prospect of a deal between Dahlan and Hamas represents something different, which is Gazans working together to solve Gazans' problems, which, which we've not seen uh, at play in a long time. So that's something to be watching. Let me, let me shift gears a little bit and talk about regional politics, as you, as Khalil, as you, you mentioned. Uh, what, are, what are Egypt's motivations? What are their interests? And what are the Emirates' interests and motivations? For Egypt, I think it's pretty clear. Their primary interest is, first of all, security, their own security and their own security, particularly in the Sinai, where there's this insurgency uh, led by a, um, an ISIS affiliate. Uh, Egypt also wants to maintain the leading role that it's always played in steering events within Gaza. Uh, President el-Sisi is no friend of Hamas which has ties to the Muslim Brotherhood, but he presumably sees benefits to Egypt in working with Hamas as long as Dahlan is part of this equation and able to protect Egypt's interests. And as, as we have seen, as part of this, uh, the talks that are underway that the Egyptians have led, Hamas has publicly cut its ties with the Muslim Brotherhood, which is an interesting development. Uh, for the Emirates, it seems their primary interest is um, the displacement of Qatar from its role in Gaza. Qatar's played a large role in the last decade or so in funding development projects. Uh, they have been supportive of Hamas. Um, you all know that there is this ongoing fight within the GCC at the moment between Qatar on one hand and Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and some of the others on the other side. Uh, so that, that is affecting, I th that's being played out to an extent in this rivalry in Gaza as well. Uh, the Emiratis, I think, are also trying to reduce Iranian influence with Hamas. Um, Iran has long been a supporter of Hamas and a funder of the military wing. The Emiratis, I think, are trying to reduce that to the extent they can um, with this deal. Uh, again, the Emiratis have little sim sympathy for Hamas, but I think uh, they're trusting Dahlan to protect their interests in this as well. Uh, for both the, the Egyptians and the Emirates, given their problems with Abu Mazen, they're probably also thinking about how this affects the succession, who will be the ultimate replacement for uh, uh, Abu Mazen. Uh, Khalil, you asked about what are Dahlan's motivations. I think that very much is what is on Dahlan's mind. He's looking to position himself as a succession process begins to develop. Uh, he's, he's, he's got some following within Gaza, not very much in the West Bank. Uh, he's probably looking to strengthen his position in Gaza by, by, by bringing in assistance from the Emirates, by opening the crossing point to Egypt, uh, trying to position himself to be seen as helping the people of Gaza 
when uh, Abu Mazen and Ramallah has not been able to do that up until now. Uh, the Emirates and Egyptians, I think, um, in their support of Dahlan are, are trying to help position him uh, in the succession battle. Uh, a quick word about, about Israel before I finish up. Israel seems to have been staying out of all of this for the most part, which is probably a good strategy on their part. Uh, Israel's overriding interest in Gaza is security, and I think it was through, through the lens of security that they will judge this deal. Uh, if Hamas wants quiet on the border uh, so that it can work with Tahlan and improve the lives of Gazans, I think the Israelis will, will happily go along with that. Uh, however, if, if that's not the case, Israel is certainly prepared for another confrontation with Hamas, as they have in the past. Uh, Israel also seems to be staying out of the PA succession issue at the moment, which again is, I think, a wise strategy on their part. Uh, and within Israel, I think there are mixed views about Tahlan. There's some support within in some circles, maybe in some of the political circles, less so um, in, the, in the security services that dealt with him before. So uh, it, summing up, uh, I'd say that in the, in the long term, Gaza's prospects are, um, are cloudy at best. But in the short term, there is some potential here to improve people's lives. Even very simple things like uh, a, steady a steady supply of electricity, which has not been the case up until now can make a huge difference in people's lives, uh, generating power or providing more water to the Gaza Strip. Again, small things can be done, which could have a big impact, at least in the short term, in people's lives. Um, and the last point I'll make is that I think the thing that I think is the most interesting about these reports of Hamas and Dahlan working together is, is that it represents, for the first time in a long time, an effort by Gazans themselves to try to address Gaza's problems. For at least the last decade, uh, parties outside Gaza, Israel, and the PA and Ramallah in particular, uh, have, have not helped Gaza. In fact, they've contributed to the problems within Gaza. Uh, so the possibility that this mismatched team of Dahlan and Hamas, uh, all of them from Gaza, that they may be able to work together in a way that, that addresses the real problems there that others on the outside have not been able to do. That's an interesting possibility. Again, it remains to be seen whether that's going to work or not, but I think it bears, bears some close watching. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jake. Just a quick remark uh, with regards to, uh, it might be strange for an American audience uh, to mention electricity as uh, such a vital uh, an important thing that we tend to take for granted, yes. but in talking to uh, my extended family in, in Gaza, who have been there for quite a few years, mm -hmm. several centuries actually, uh, <laughs> they tell me that they are averaging two to four hours a day of electricity. So to understand uh, yeah, what you. Jake just said with regards to the electricity and the importance on a humanitarian and human level uh, to the natives of, of Gaza, it's important to keep that in mind. And now, Yusuf, please. Thank you, uh, Khalil, and thank you all for being here. And thank you, Ambassador, for your uh, remarks. Um, I, I'm going to try to answer the questions in the course of the uh, uh, comments that I will make, although I will note that you stated that there were five questions, and I got to number five, and then you had about seven more. So I will do my best to try to. <laughs> To get to all seven of those. in total. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, but but I think a good a good part of them will be um, will be covered here. Um, I, I want to begin by talking about what I think is one of the, the the central problems that all of the different actors or most of the the, the different actors uh, really have undergirding their policy towards Gaza and have for several years. And this is this siege policy mentality. This idea that the way to address Gaza is to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze, and that's how we will get Gaza and the people there and the people in charge there to do what it is that we want them to do. Uh, and this has more or less been the case since uh, 2006, uh, and we are uh, now 10 years into uh, the siege and what proceeded after that with the Hamas and Fatah. Uh, conflict in 2007, something the ambassador had a front row seat to. Uh, and what 
has resulted, and we, we often hear, and Khalil referred to the conditions there, we often hear about Gaza being called an open air prison. I think that's accurate, but I would also describe it as the most bizarre and inhumane uh, socio-political experiment that the world has ever seen, where you have two million people, half of whom are under the age of 18, and all of these actors on the outside are sitting there thinking about how can we squeeze them a little bit more. To the point where the Israelis, who were the, the primary culprit, of course, in the siege policy, actually calculated the precise caloric intake that Gazans would be required to have to, quote, put them on a diet and keep them just short of collapsing. So that you don't have a humanitarian catastrophe, but you have a humanitarian crisis that the leadership there would have to try to deal with. Uh, and I think what we've seen for uh, you know, the past 10 years is that really has not worked uh, and has only created the crisis, furthered the crisis that we see uh, on the ground. And one, I th one of the major problems that I think we, we saw in, in the debacle of 2006 and 2007 in terms of US policy is that you had this challenge of the executive branch trying to further certain policy objectives as it relates to the Israelis and Palestinians, and doing so within the laws and the challenges of, of, of the laws that were created by uh, the United States Congress as it relates to the parties on the ground. And I don't see how with this uh, plan, uh, those challenges go away. I don't, I don't think they do. Uh, I think they still remain. Uh, and I think what we've started to see change now, although the mentality is still there, the siege policy mentality is there, is that there's an acceleration in the last several months. And what I've heard one uh, official describe it as is a situation in which the conditions for pressure are now ripe. And this uh, conclusion uh, is reached uh, because the players on the outside, the Palestinian Authority, the Israelis, parties elsewhere in the region, have looked at the previous situation and said, well, the, Hamas is not quite ripe enough for change right now because the leadership was divided uh, in terms of where they were located. And now the election of this uh, new figure in Yahya Sinwar uh, brings the uh, both political uh, uh, leadership the, and, and the, the military uh, leadership into one physical place where the ability of pressure to be uh, effective would be uh, heightened. And it's one of the reasons why I think you're seeing this uh, acceleration now. Um, and you also, I think, see this because you have a new administration now uh, and um, there are openings for different agendas to be pushed. Uh, whether it's agendas by states in the Gulf or by the Palestinian uh, Authority, uh, who may be seeking to uh, demonstrate to the new administration a commitment to try to move things forward uh, with a accelerated squeeze uh, on the Gaza Strip. Uh, but I think, I think all of these approaches uh, and, and, this, uh, and this plan really ignore one of the most central problems that we have seen when it comes to um, the, the challenge of trying to make Israeli-Palestinian peace and in US policy. Uh, and that's the crisis of legitimacy in Palestinian leadership. Uh, and it is, in fact, uh, a severe crisis. And I would ask you to think back to the days of, of Yasser Arafat, uh, who I think uh, all of us can agree uh, in those days was in a far stronger position in terms of domestic legitimacy than any of the actors that exist on the ground today, whether it's uh, Mahmoud Abbas or the various uh, potential successors in Fatah or Hamas or what have you. Uh, even he at that point was not in a position to be able to sign off on an agreement with the Israelis precisely because he didn't have the legitimacy among Palestinians to sign away what he was being asked to sign away. And since then, the crisis of legitimacy in Palestinian leadership has deteriorated by magnitudes. And I think what we are seeing with this plan now would only be a further step in that uh, direction. 
Uh, we all know that Mahmoud Abbas was uh, elected to the presidency in 2005. Uh, he is now in the 12th year of his term. Uh, you have, uh, even in that situation, uh, a leader that was elected by a fraction of the Palestinians that they would ultimately be representing at the negotiating table. So you already have that challenge. Uh, then you have the further challenge of the hamas fatah divide, which emerged after 2006-2007 uh, and has been exacerbated since. And you also have on top of that internal Fatah rivalries, which will emerge further uh, in, the, uh, in the future as uh, the question of succession comes uh, to the fore. Uh, and you know, Khalil, you characterize this as the Dahlan plan. I would at least call it Dahlan plan B. Uh, it might even be version C by this point, depending on how far you want to go back. But when we talk about these Fatah rivalries, I think it's important to remember that before this plan to try to bring Dahlan back into Palestinian politics through Gaza was concocted, uh, there was a plan to try to reinsert Dahlan into Palestinian politics through the West Bank by pressuring the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank uh, to permit Dahlan and Dahlan loyalists to have a presence in the rare Fatah conference that took place uh, last uh, November. That, if you want to call that Dahlan Plan A or Plan B, failed, obviously. Uh, and this is the now the, the new pathway. I say all this to say that um, even with Abbas's challenges with legitimacy and Hamas's challenges with legitimacy, uh, and all of their flaws, and there's no shortage of them that we can go through. At some point in time, they were still elected by Palestinians through unrepresentative institutions as a fraction of the population. But nonetheless, it was Palestinians who put them in positions of power. With this plan, you are having a Palestinian leader inserted into Palestinian politics, not by Palestinians, but by outsiders. And so I think what, what this plan would end up doing in the long term, whether it you know, leads to some short-term benefits of perhaps going from four hours of electricity a day to six hours of electricity a day or what have you, in the long term, it exacerbates this crisis of legitimacy. Uh, and it is not something that I think serves the interests of, of, uh, of Palestinians uh, down the line. And one of the... the the more interesting things that I've read in recent weeks about this issue is this notion that Egypt is interested in having somebody in Gaza who can watch over Hamas. And you know, I, I read that and I think to myself, if you're thinking Dahlan or an assistant to Dahlan is going to be watching over Hamas in Gaza, who's going to be watching who uh, in, in that situation? I think we, we remember what took place in 2007 and the, the, the notion that you can put a strong man in place uh, to, to try to dictate uh, policy over there has proven time and again to be a failure in this uh, situation. I also think that one of the major problems with this is that should it go through, uh, even if Hamas was to cooperate with this at some point, it would cement the divide between Gaza and the West Bank and not bring the two uh, territories and the two polities closer together. Uh, I think, you know, as the ambassador pointed out, Dahlan has some modicum of support uh, in Gaza. I think uh, the latest polls had him at something like 17% in the Gaza Strip, people who support him to, uh, you know, be a, a leader, uh, and about 1% in the West Bank, 1%. Uh, and so, you know, in the West Bank, there are a number of di different people who are waiting for their opportunities at succession within Fatah as well. So what happens in the aftermath of, of Mahmoud Abbas when that succession actually starts, that succession rivalry starts to, to take place, that power struggle starts to take place, even if you have Dahlan in Gaza? What is going to happen then? There are going to be multiple people in the West Bank who are going to be vying for the leadership with uh, Dahlan inside uh, Fatah, and that is only, in my view, going to increase the prospect of a continued divide between the West Bank uh, and, and uh, the Gaza Strip. And what does Israel get out of all of this? 
I think that's an important question that nobody seems to be asking. What, what is the Israeli position towards this? Um, are, are the Israel, Israelis really going to go along with this idea that uh, Mahmoud Dahlan, because of his connections to friendly states and to uh, you know, Western intelligence services, will be a reliable check on Hamas and they're going to suddenly start trusting that process down the line? Uh, I find that hard to believe. Are the challenges of in US policy of trying to relate to the parties on the ground without getting on the wrong side of the, um, you know, the, the, the legislative uh, web that exists when it comes to dealing with parties like Hamas and so on, is that going to suddenly go away? I, I don't think so. So I think if you're the Israelis, uh, you're looking at this and you're saying whether Dahlan gets in or not, uh, there is a recipe here for continued long-term division among Palestinians and a continuation of the status quo, uh, which uh, I, I think might suit the interests of an Israeli government that's not interested in changing things, but certainly does not uh, suit the interests uh, of advancing a just peace in the region. And the final question I have about um, this entire situation is where does this fit into U.S. policy? Uh, we've heard almost nothing from the United States about what is transpiring around uh, Gaza and with this uh, entire plan. How does this fit the long-term vision, whatever it is, of what the United States at least states that it wants to see, if we figured out what that is uh, six months or so into this administration? Um, do they view this as furthering the prospects of peace? How does that happen? Um, and uh, I, I think what we're seeing is a, a number of different attempts at changing situations on the ground that don't really fit into a broader US policy on this issue because there isn't one beyond maintaining the status quo. Uh, and I think that uh, in the absence of a real American vision to change the situation, which I don't think is forthcoming anytime soon, um, then we're unlikely to see any change on the ground, Dahlan or Thank you, Yusuf. And uh, now we open the floor for uh, comments or questions. Uh, please forward your uh, cards forward uh, so we can acknowledge. Put your name uh, on your card. And if you want to address it to any particular person, uh, please uh, do that. And um, thank you. All right, the first question to both uh, speakers uh, from Hani and Madhun at uh, Anira. What are some uh, simple measures that Israel can take at this time to improve life in the Gaza Strip? Yusuf? Uh, you know, the, the, there's, there's a long answer and a short answer. The short answer is, of course, end, end the policies of siege uh, on the Gaza Strip. The longer answer can include um, you know, start living up to the agreements that were made in 2004 and 2005 around movement and access, which were regulating the number of trucks that were supposed to come in each day into the Gaza Strip, which have never since uh, that uh, time ever been fulfilled. Uh, start permitting, you know, uh, cancer patients, for God's sake, to get out of the Gaza Strip on a routine basis instead of what we've heard in recent years and months is that these emergency humanitarian cases for permits have been denied. I mean, the list is, uh, the list is endless. And as, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, the, the, the crisis that we see in the Gaza Strip, which the United Nations has said will be a situation that is unlivable by 2020, is primarily the product of Israeli policy. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I'd agree with all that. I, I mean, I think, uh, as they say about the medical profession, first do no harm, and I think that might be the best advice to Israel is if they can do their part to maintain uh, quiet um, and avoid another war in Gaza, that would be an important, uh, important thing that, that they can do. But beyond that, I think, as, as um, Yusuf said, movement and access, um, allowing more goods to move back and forth, 
facilitating electricity, facilitating um, um, progress on issues of water and sanitation and those sorts of things, where Israel has an interest. When the sanitation in Gaza flows up to Ashkelon, uh, it's a problem for Israel too, and they, they, they have a role as well in, in dealing with some of those issues. And they can not only serve their own interests, but help people in Gaza as well. All right, thank you. Uh, the next one is a comment from uh, Muhammad Awais. They got us where they want us to basically talk about who is the next chief rather than about occupation. Uh, any comment on that, or are you satisfied with the comment? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Paul Tyson, uh, State Department. Uh, a Gaza with open borders, its own port, uh, airport, all this talk about uh, agriculture, manufacturing, tourism, remittances, and so on. How does Gaza pay its way through these? I mean, you, you've spent many years focusing uh, on, on, on Gaza. Does it have the potential? to pay its own bills uh, if the division remains? Um, certainly not in, in the short term. I mean, Gaza doesn't have much to export. There's no, uh, I mean, they export oranges. In the old days, the oranges and strawberries and things like that. Um, you know, looking sort of way into the future, there are uh, offshore oil reserves. There have been discussions in the past about how that gets divvied up. Um, but none of that's going to move until there's a, a resolution of the political issues uh, between Israel and the Palestinians and some reconciliation between Gaza and the West Bank, between Hamas and Fatah. So um, again, I think the, the, these the discussions about Gaza being an entrepot with uh, Singapore of the Middle East, that sort of thing, um, I think that's uh, it's certainly not realistic in any sort of reasonable time frame to talk about that. Can I just add that you know it's unrealistic for for Gaza to be Singapore, um, but you also have to let it be what it can be, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the what we have seen in Gaza is is the is calculated policies of de-developing the economic situation there. Uh, that I mean, what we've seen over the last ten years is entire industries disappear because of the siege. You have you know, uh, huge percentages of the arable land in Gaza that are no longer able to produce uh, for uh, Palestinians there, farmers and so on. That was a big part of, of the, the economy was exporting agriculture because of the buffer zones and because of the constant destruction that takes place around the border. The fishing industry, we're talking about a coastal territory. You know, it's, it's been a staple of, of, of life in Gaza for millennia. For as long as, it, as there's been civilization there, there's been fishing. But today, most of the fish in Gaza come from farms on land because fishermen are not even allowed out beyond three or four nautical miles. So you, you know, Gaza doesn't need to be Singapore. Just let it be what it can be. Uh, and you know, in, in, instead of imposing all of these debts on it, just, just stop doing that. And I don't think we need to worry about offshore resources or, or, or whatever else. The, the first thing is, these policies aimed at destroying the economy have to stop. Uh, Case Boshar from NAD, uh, addressed to you, Yusuf. Uh, what position should the U.S. government uh, have on this uh, ongoing Tahlan negotiations, or should uh, they simply stay out of this? The U.S. should stay out of this uh, affair. Well, look, I think the, the United States has to determine what its real goal in the region is, uh, and, and you formulate policy from that point forward. Um, but it seems to me that uh, the United States is uh, determined over the last several years, and this is not just about Israel-Palestine, but the region in particular, uh, is that it's, it's simply, it's not interested in engagement in the region beyond the minimum that's necessary. And I think that uh, the, the, the difficulties that are perceived by policymakers as it relates to the Israeli-Palestinian issue, both because of the situation on the ground and because of our own politics here in the United States, is that we're not going to be able to fix this thing, and as long as it's manageable, let's just keep it manageable. Uh, I think that's what the policy has been, and unfortunately, this doesn't fall outside of that. As long as this doesn't erupt into further conflict, I think that's part of the reason why you're seeing the United States say, stay so silent 
uh, on all of this, particularly this administration, I would say. Okay, we have a couple questions from Dan Raviv, I-24 News, uh, addressed to both of you. Uh, what is the best way to get President Trump's attention on Gaza? <laughs> Uh, somebody needs to tweet about it. We'll, we'll read the tweet. Um, I, tweet, Dan. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I don't. Th I don't think Gaza is is really on um, on, the, on agenda, the agenda. On the agenda. Um, uh, to the extent that Israel Palestine is, it's it's the big deal. It's not the the details of who's in charge in Gaza. Um, I think it, at least insofar as, as Gaza is concerned, that may be a good thing, that there's nothing much that the U.S. could do to, to, to help uh, either the Dahlan Hamas arrangement work or some alternate arrangement between Fatah and, and Abu Mazen and Hamas. Uh, we really can't do much to affect that. Uh, Hamas is, after all, a terrorist organization. We have no contact with them. As long as Hamas has some role in running Gaza, whether it's 100% or 50% with Dahlan, uh, the U.S. administration is still not going to deal with them. Uh, it's not just a matter of policy, that's a matter of law. Uh, that's why we cut ties after 2007. Uh, so uh, at least as, as, as it affects Gaza, it's probably for the best that the administration not be really involved with this. Okay, uh, this is also uh, Dan uh, Raviv saying, uh, would um, the rapport between Egypt and the Trump administration, would that help in any advisory capacity to convince the administration uh, to do something about uh, like real change uh, in, in Gaza? I don't think so. <laughs> all right, short and sweet. I don't think so. Uh, all right. Uh, this is also addressed to both uh, speakers. How uh, does or did the rift between Qatar and Egypt, uh, how did that affect the situation in Gaza, if any at all? Uh, well, I think that's it's part of it. I mean, it's, it's not just Egypt. It's Egypt plus the Emirates plus Saudi plus Bahrain. Those are the four that have been at odds with, uh, with Qatar. Um, uh, I think. Um, all of these outside parties um, are, are using Gaza as part of their larger problems and settling scores in Gaza. Uh, so particularly in the part of the, the Emirates, but also the Egyptians, they're looking to supplant the role of Qatar in Gaza. That's why the Emirates are putting their own money into, into this. Um, I think Egypt has long seen itself as the principal outside party um, responsible for or um, involved in, in Gaza's affairs, they want to preserve that primacy in their own, uh, because it affects their own security. Uh, so I think all of these regional rivalries are, as we're seeing them play out a bit in Gaza, um, it's not necessarily for the, for, uh, none of this is really in the interest of the Gazans. Um, but, and again, it remains to be seen how, how all of these battles will, 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 will conclude. All right. Uh, this one is from Paul Tyson, uh, again, um, on the Egyptian uh, relations uh, with uh, Gaza. Would you care, Yusuf, to comment on the Adelphi line and the smuggling uh, way of life, if you will, uh, across uh, the border and the kind of security implications of that and uh, from the perspective of the different parties? Well, you know, the the... This is also connected to the last question. I will say that the Egyptians have their own interests vis-a-vis -vis Gaza that uh, obviously you know, are, are independent of their relations with other states long before they became as dependent as they are today on uh, some states uh, in the Gulf. Uh, and, and one of the, the main reasons why is the security situation in the Sinai. And from the Egyptian perspective, um, that, that has a lot to do with their uh, policy towards Gaza, and particularly on the question of the tunnels. Um, but ag again, you know, the, the, the reason that tunnels were dug is because there was no access to the outside world. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, today, you know, you're seeing closing of these tunnels, uh, particularly after, you know, 2014, we've seen a lot of that. Uh, there's talk about 
you know, uh, new Israeli technology that would prevent, um, you know, tunnels from uh, being built. Um, but all of this is just an adjustment to, to the reality of the siege. Uh, tomorrow, you know, you, you might see a different form of um, economic uh, transport. Uh, maybe tomorrow it's drones. Uh, maybe that is what is uh, involved in smuggling. Maybe that's what is going to be involved in the, um, you know, uh, the conflicts in the future, as we've already seen that projectiles have dominated that. What's the next step? Are they going to build a roof over Gaza as well? You know, the, the, the entire policy leads to madness. This, this idea of trying to just erase two million people from the face of the earth because you don't want to deal with them leads to all of these absurd sort of ideas of, of how to handle security. Um, and, and so I think that it all goes back to that at the end of the day. Okay, uh, addressed to both of you, uh, is there any role uh, for Turkey uh, in this mix? Uh, well, Turkey tried to play a role actually um, in uh, recently in promoting reconciliation between uh, Abu Mazen and Hamas. And uh, um, it didn't go very far, I think partly because the Egyptians intervened. The Egyptians have always, as I said, seen themselves as the primary outside party. Um, and they've always been the ones to broker these kind of talks in Cairo. Uh, so I think it was, it was shut down pretty, pretty quickly. Um, Again, all of these outside parties trying to, to play roles in Gaza isn't necessarily helpful. Um, you know, supplanting the, the Qataris by the Emiratis is not necessarily a positive. Supplanting uh, the Egyptians with the Turks is also probably not going to help. So, um, again, I think if, if, if Abu Mazen and Hamas genuinely want to reconcile with each other, they know how to talk to each other. They don't need the Turks. They don't need anybody else. They just need a hotel in a hotel restaurant in, in Cairo and they can talk to each other. But I, I yeah, would just add to that, Egypt. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's even really possible if they wanted to, right? Because at, 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 the, at the end of the day, you know, Abbas's authority in the, the West Bank, the security services, uh, all of that is supported <laughs> by Western donors, the European Union, the United mm -hmm. States, and all of that funding comes with strings attached. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why in 2007, as, as, as you well know, we had the difficulty that we had when it came to relating to the situation. We, we pushed for an election. U.S. policy was in support of the election at the time. And then as soon as you got a government that you didn't like, we can't deal with them. You know? um, so I, it, it's, even if Abbas tomorrow wakes up and says the right thing for, for the Palestinian national interest is for me and the leadership of Hamas to sit down and work this thing out no matter what. Can he really do that? I don't, I don't think he's in a position mm -hmm. to do that. But what if he doesn't wake up? Whoever comes next will be in the same position. All right, uh, one of you mentioned that uh, Israel's uh, Security interest is, is the primary uh, interest, uh, are the primary factor in terms of Israel's handling uh, of Gaza. How do you explain all the measures uh, taken uh, by Israel with regards to affecting the lives of uh, fishermen, the sonic booms, delay of exports, delaying of, uh, I mean, uh, don't these uh, affect the security of Israel too? Or are they justified by the serving the security of Israel? Both. Well, I, 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 it was my comment. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 didn't, I didn't mean it to, to say that what Israel does is justified, but I think from an Israeli point of view, when they take these measures, they're, they're thinking about it in terms of their own security. Um, whether in the long run it really co it contributes much to Israeli security to, to put such harsh measures on Gaza, I'm not so sure it does. Um, but sort of going back to the comment I made earlier, uh, what I was trying to say is, in terms of how they view uh, any potential deal between Dahlan and Hamas, they will, they will think about it, does that serve their interests? Will it, in other words, will it, will it be less likely 
that Israel will, will be fighting a war in Gaza as a result of this deal or not. And I think those, that's, that's how they will, they will evaluate it. Um, frankly, so far, they seem to be staying, staying out of it, which is probably for the best, because anything that they do to affect it one way or the other probably undermines their security rather than promotes their security. All right, we're going to conclude with, yeah, go ahead. Continue on that. Um, you know, is Israeli policy towards Gaza, particularly post-2004, 2005, is not just shaped by security, uh, but it's also shaped by how they want Gaza to turn out. And I, I would encourage everybody to uh, go back and read the lengthy <coughs> interview that Ariel Sharon's uh, aide gave to Haaretz, explaining the rationale behind the Israeli withdrawal of its settlers from the Gaza Strip and what the objectives were. And one of the things that he outlines there is he says, look, this withdrawal is formaldehyde for the peace process. It's about preventing the peace process from going forward because the world will see what it looks like when Palestinians get to control their own territory. And so the Israeli objective became making sure that nothing successful could happen in Gaza. And to this day, you will hear them say, Look at what's happening in Gaza. You want to create a Palestinian state in the West Bank too? We already tried that. They ruined it, right? As if Palestinians in Gaza were independently control of everything that, that took place there. So it's not, it's not just about security. There are plenty of things that the Israelis have done over the last 10 years which make no sense in terms of security, including their behavior in 2014 during the, during the war. Uh, it's about a lot more than that. All right, this uh, next question is to Jake. Um, Shara Bahbah is asking, it has been rumored uh, lately, or reported in the media, uh, that Hamas and Hezbollah are now working uh, together more and more. Uh, in the event that Israel attacks uh, either Gaza or South Lebanon, do you see Iran's influence as benefiting or taking advantage of that? Um. Well, Iran certainly has been supportive of both Hezbollah and Hamas in the past, and they continue to do so. Uh, the ties between uh, Iran and Hezbollah are extremely close. Uh, I think they've strengthened as a result of everything that's happened in Syria over the last couple of years. Um, and from, as Israel looks at the situation, um, I think they're quite concerned about um, about Hezbollah's intentions, what might be happening, whether they may be implanting themselves in Syria permanently, whether the Iranians will implant themselves in, in Syria permanently. So that's a matter of concern. How Hamas plays into that is, is not clear. Um, there have always, there's always been a more, it's always been a more complicated relationship between Hamas uh, and Iran than it is between Hezbollah and Iran. Um, uh, in one case, they're, they're both Shia, the other, the other case, they're not. So there's, there's a natural affinity in one, but not so much in the other. Um, and again, it's not clear whether all of these discussions going on about the future of Gaza uh, will involve some change in the relationship between Hamas and Iran. Uh, that's, that's one thing to watch. Um, but um, so far, what I, what I haven't seen a lot, a lot to indicate is that there's some some coordination between what's going on between Iran and Hezbollah and what's going on in Gaza. That does not, as far as I can see, there doesn't seem to be that kind of coordination. Okay. All right, last uh, question, but not least. Brian Barber is addressing this uh, question when uh, <coughs> directed to Yusuf. You rightly uh, faulted uh, the lack of legitimacy on the part of the Palestinian leadership. But how do you achieve legitimacy under occupation? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think we know a lot uh, of what not to do, right? Um, uh, I think, you know, what we've seen over, really, th since the Oslo process is the deterioration of, of Palestinian institutions, um, including the, the PLO, uh, which, for all of its faults, uh, at least had a claim to representing Palestinians in a, a broader way than the Palestinian Authority did. Um, so I, I, I think there's a need for discussions about how to reinvigorate and improve and reform 
um, Palestinian national institutions that include all elements of Palestinian society uh, for there to really be a leadership that can have a claim to legitimacy. And this is not only about you know, the Palestinian interests, but it's about the interests of ever coming to some kind of agreement on this issue. Because I, I can find a Palestinian from somewhere that can sign off on a piece of paper, but if, if, they, don't, if they don't carry the legitimacy and respect of, of, of all of the stakeholders or enough of the stakeholders, it's, a, it, it's, it's not worth the piece of paper that it's written on. And I think we've known that all along. From the perspective of U.S. policy, we've known that all along. Uh, and even though we've constantly been moving in the other direction, we've, we've never really done anything to prevent that from happening, despite saying that our goal is a negotiated solution. Um, so I, I, think, I think, obviously, first we've got to reverse the trend and then start talking about how we invigorate and legitimize Palestinian national institutions. All right, with that, let me uh, thank all of you for being here today. I'd like to remind you uh, of uh, October 26, our annual conference, which would be a uh, first year assessment of the Trump administration's policy in the Middle East. It should take two seconds, but you're welcome to attend. <laughs> and uh, I would like to thank you also for your great questions and, and comments. And, uh, Please join me in thanking our great uh, speakers for their presentation. Thank you very much.